This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's Friday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. One of my goals with this series is to get around to looking at every single set, and so far I've done about 10 of them, and we're doing another one today, we're looking at Prophecy. Prophecy was released in June of 2000 as the last set in Masks block. Prophecy is actually kind of special to me, as I started playing in Urza's block, but I basically had just gotten a few booster packs and starter decks for those expansions. Prophecy was the first set where I got a whole bunch of booster packs, and I thought a lot of the cards I got were super cool. And I still sort of do, just for nostalgia. Because, in actuality, Prophecy is considered by most to be one of the worst sets ever. I've done several other top 10s on sets that are considered bad, since I think it's pretty interesting to see the cards that defy the general badness of the set they're printed in. Other sets I've looked at that are considered bad, and by bad I mean underpowered, are The Dark, Fallen Empires, and Homeland, but uh, I think maybe Prophecy takes the cake when it comes to bad sets, as this list is a pretty underpowered one. The other bad sets we've looked at have had cards that have remained impactful in Magic since they were printed, but as you'll see, that just isn't the case here. Still, there are cards that found some success in this set. In all, there are 144 cards in Prophecy, a mere 13 of them have at least one point using my scoring system, and in this video we'll look at the 10 that have left the biggest impact on competitive Magic. Before we get to the list, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A top 8 at a Pro Tour, Players Tour, Mythic Championship, Mythic Invitational, Legacy, or Vintage Championship is worth 2 points, and a top 8 at a Magic Fester Grand Prix is worth 1 point. And number 10, it is Withdraw. For 2 blue mana, Withdraw lets you bounce a creature, and it comes with the added bonus of allowing you to bounce two creatures if your opponent doesn't have a spare mana lying around. If you time it right, this can give you some pretty impressive tempo, as returning two creatures for only two mana is a pretty good deal, and it doesn't have the worst baseline either. Two mana to bounce a creature is kind of reasonable. The mana wasn't the easiest for non-mono blue decks though, especially in block and standard where there wasn't much fixing. It gained its only top eight in a mono blue skies deck at Pro Tour Chicago in 2000. At number 9, it is Ristic Lightning. As we saw with Withdraw, Prophecy is a theme where opponents can pay some amount of mana to weaken a card. Most of the cards that do this have Ristic in their name, like Ristic Lightning here, as well as the much more famous commander staple, Ristic Study. Most of these cards aren't very good, and some of them let you ignore what a card does entirely. Ristic Study and Ristic Lightning are kind of the outliers. With Ristic Lightning, you have a 3 mana spell that does 4 damage to any target, which is a great deal. However, if they do have 2 mana, it turns into a shock that costs 3 times the mana, which is pretty bad. Still, if you could time this right, it was a nice burn spell. Ristic Lightning was featured in some versions of the red-green Fires of Yavimaya aggro deck in Standard. At number 8, it is Flame Shot, a pitch spell that lets you discard a mountain to avoid paying mana for it. It has the same score as Ristic Lightning, but a higher average finish, so I gave it the edge. There is a cycle of uncommon pitch spells in Prophecy, and obviously this is the red one. Anyway, if you cast it normally, it has kind of a rough cost. 4 mana for 3 damage isn't stupendous, even if you can divide the damage how you want. Obviously though, being able to cast this for free is a big deal, and that's what allowed it to see a bit of play. It isn't nearly as powerful as other pitch spells, as 2 for 1-ing yourself for 3 damage doesn't always make sense. Plus, you have to discard a mountain in particular for it, which is pretty specific. Still, it found some success in red-green aggro decks in Standard. At number 7, it is Scoria Cat. Another theme in Prophecy revolved around all your lands being tapped, which you could get a bonus for, like with Scoria Cat. A 5 mana 3 3 is terrible, but if all your lands are tapped, it becomes a 5 mana 6 6, something that is quite imposing, and was especially so in Magic's earlier days, where on average, creatures weren't as efficient as they are today. Obviously, to make it a 6 6, you will normally have to play everything in your first main phase and or during combat but that cost is often worth it. It is also something that just happened organically in Fires of Yavimaya aggro decks. If the eponymous enchantment was in play, all your creatures had haste, so you tended to play them all in your first main phase anyway, tapping all of your mana. It gained all of its points in aggro decks in standard. At number 6, it is Spike Tail Hatchling, which can sacrifice itself for the cause in order to force spike something. A card like this is particularly annoying for people to play against because it essentially makes them wait a turn to cast their more powerful spells. Especially if you play this on turn 2, and in the meantime, the Hatchling can be attacking in the sky. 
Spike Till Hatchling managed two Pro Tour top eights in the standard of 2000 to 2001. One of them came in a mono blue deck that was loaded up with flyers and counter magic, and Spike Till Hatchling was the only card in the deck that could do both. The other top eight came in an opposition deck, a deck that made really effective use of the Hatchling because it liked to lock down the opponent's mana with opposition and static orb, and if you had a Hatchling in play while you were doing that, it was going to make it even harder for your opponent to successfully cast a spell. The Hatchling, like most cards on this list, doesn't have any points since the early 2000s. And number five, it is Rebel Informer. Rebels and Mercenaries were a huge theme in Masks Block. Creatures with both of these types were capable of searching up creatures from your library and putting them directly into play. Overall, Rebels were way better, and they came to completely dominate Masks Block Constructed and Standard as a result. However, there were some cards that helped you hose Rebels significantly, and that's where Rebel Informer comes in. The Informer could get rid of those pesky Rebels directly from the battlefield and also couldn't be targeted by anything white, and most Rebel decks were mono-white. Obviously, it took that very specific metagame for this 3-mana 1-2 to do its thing. Rebels haven't been much of a factor since the year 2000, though, and for that reason, the Informer has never gained any more points. And number four is Megiddo the Lion. One of the cooler themes in Masks Block was that of Spell Shapers, creatures who had an ability that had you discard a card, tap it, and pay some mana for an effect from one of Magic's iconic spells. Prophecy had a cycle of legendary Spell Shapers, and all of them were capable of casting one of their color's most powerful spells ever. As a result, these legendary Spell Shapers, like Megiddo, actually required you to discard two cards for the effect, unlike other Spell Shapers. In Megiddo's case, he could effectively cast Wrath of God. Except it was actually a tiny bit better, because Megiddo didn't die to the effect and you could do it at instant speed. This is pretty powerful even by today's standards, and even with the cost of having to discard two cards. He saw playing a pretty wide variety of decks in Standard, gaining points in Rebels, the Anti-Rebel deck, and Band Control. And number three, it is Avatar of Woe. This was one of the first rares that 11-year-old me got from a Prophecy booster, and I remember thinking it was incredible. It's part of a neat cycle of Avatars, there's one for each color, and they're all overcosted creatures, but they all have some sort of cost reduction effect that makes them very cheap. For Avatar of Woe, you have an 8-mana 6-5 with Fear and the ability to simply tap to destroy creatures. That's pretty powerful, but it just gets silly when there are 10 or more creature cards in all graveyards, as 2 black mana for this powerful creature is awesome. Unlike the other cards we've seen so far, Avatar of Woe didn't have any impact on block or standard. Instead, she found a home in reanimator decks and extended. These decks sought to fill their graveyard and then reanimate powerful creatures for very little mana with spells like Reanimate. The Avatar was really well suited to these decks because it was both a powerful thing to reanimate and a creature you just could cast quite easily by the middle part of the game because you'd have so many creatures in your graveyard. While reanimator decks are obviously still a thing these days, there are just way more powerful things those decks can do, and Avatar of Woe doesn't have any points since 2003. At number two, it is Foil, the blue card in the cycle of uncommon pitch spells in Prophecy. It's a free counterspell, and those usually manage to see at least some play. Unlike most of this cycle, you not only have to discard a basic land of the same color as the spell, but you also have to discard an additional card. This means you have to 3 for 1 yourself to cast it for free, but because it is a straight up hard counter, that can be worth it. And while 4 mana to counter a spell isn't a great deal, that being the fail case isn't too bad. It saw success in the standard of 2000 and 2001, seeing play in traditional blue control decks, as well as the more creature-based opposition control decks of the time, which I mentioned earlier. In Extended, it saw play in what is one of my personal favorite decks ever, Super Grow, which was an aggro control deck that aimed to get Query and Dryad in play and then proceeded to play a Drago-type game where the Dryad continued to grow to massive size as spells are countered and creatures are destroyed. Foil doesn't have any points since 2005, which makes sense. It's way worse than all the other free counter spells that are available in the Eternal formats. And at number one, it is Chimeric Idol. I'm willing to bet basically nobody saw this coming. By today's standards, this is not the most impressive card. It's a 3-mana artifact that can become a 3-3 at any time, and while you can technically do it for free, you do have to tap down all of your lands. Still, sort of like we saw with Scoria Cat, that isn't a huge cost, and a 3-mana 3-3 that's immune to sorcery speed removal wasn't too bad back in the day. It was actually quite good for aggro decks, which often planned to tap out anyway. In standard, the idol was played primarily in Fires of Yavimaya decks, which sought to use the haste that the enchantment granted to do a ton of damage in a hurry, but it was also played in Opposition, Armageddon, and Rebels decks. At Pro Tour Chicago in 2000, the idol was featured in six of the top eight decks, showing that, at the time, it was actually a very good card. It also picked up a lone point and extended, coming in a mono-red aggro deck.
Well, those are the 10 prophecy cards that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. It's important to note that only one of these cards has picked up any points since 2003, and none of them have any points since 2005, and most of them weren't even that successful in their own time, given that this list topped out at 17 points. Other bad sets we've looked at have at least one or two really iconic cards, but that just is not the case here. Prophecy might just have the best claim to the title of worst set ever. That said, at least a card like Ristic Study is a commander staple, so in that format there is a sizable impact from Prophecy. If you're interested in owning any of these Prophecy cards, you can buy them at Card Kingdom, and you can find an individual link for each card in this video in the description. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it everywhere you can. The more people that see this video, the better. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on some old videos, including others that look at specific sets, you should see some playlists on your screen now. Lastly, if you like hearing me talk about magic, consider subscribing to my other YouTube channel, Need to Hone History. Thanks for watching.